we get it. Making new relationships and strengthening existing ones is not always easy. Sometimes we wonder if we are establishing good friendships in our lives, or even if we're a friend others would want to have in their life. We long for people with which we can share the moments of joy, spend our day with, confide in. We crave authenticity and depth with one another. But how do we even get there? The good news is, the Bible has answers for improving our relationships and being the kind of friend others deserve. We need this because we're better together. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. For all of you on all of our campuses that are in person today, yay God for you. You took an extra amount of of time and energy to come and be with us and be together, and I am so grateful to each and every one of you. And for all of you who who are with us online, yay God for you. We're so grateful that you have tuned in yet another Sunday, and we welcome you to Sugar Creek Baptist Church. Something happened that I want to share with you about and I want us to celebrate together. We now have people that are watching and participating in our service that is broadcast from every single state in the United States of America, all 50 states. Yeah, it is amazing. It is absolutely amazing. Who would have ever thought? Now, there are some states that have more people that, that uh, listen in, that are a part of the service than maybe others. Obviously, the state of Texas would have the most of those people, but let me tell you the five other states that have the very most. The second state that has the most people that tune in to the broadcast is the state of California. So yay, California, thank you so much for being a part of this service. And the next one is Florida on the other side of the country. California and Florida. Then there is Georgia and there is New Jersey. Isn't that amazing, New Jersey? And then the fifth one is is, uh, Missouri. Is Missouri. So all of these and all 50 states represented, and we want to do something. We want to celebrate each and every one of you. Let's do it, church. All from all the campuses. Yay, God, that you have joined us today. We so appreciate you being a part of the service. Two weeks ago, or two years ago, I encountered a guy that uh, uh, just it, by happenstance, and we struck up a conversation. And it turns out he is a first-generation immigrant to the United States. He and his family. He is a young guy, about 20, 21 years of age, and his whole family came here from a country in the Middle East and settled right here in Sugarland. Sugarlands has people from all over the world that is a part of this county and we in this church have people from all over the world as well. We greatly reflect our county. And I had a conversation with this young guy. He was really great at English and he was just a very likable fellow and we sit and talk for quite a while and then in the course of the conversation, I asked him the question, how are you doing in Sugarland? How's Sugarland working out for you? And he said to me, I'm finding it to be a lonely place. And I was surprised and I said to him, I'm really disappointed to hear that. Tell me your story, tell me what's going on. And he said, well, where I come from, the country I come from in the evening, uh, most everybody, it's not every evening, but oftentimes would go out of their house, sit on the front porch or sit out on the sidewalk you know, by the street and and neighbors would come and they would all get together. We'd sit around and we'd talk and the kids would all play out in the street and that kind of thing. And he said, people really spent a lot of time together. And he said, gasoline was so expensive. Though we had a car, we only used it for the most necessary thing. So he said, we would go shopping by walking to the store and buy groceries and that sort of thing. We'd see people along the way, say hi to them, got to know people along that path and even the shop owners and that sort of thing. 
But he said, here, when we got here, we noticed that a whole lot of our time is spent indoors in our house, getting in the car, traveling everywhere we go by car and going into the shops. He said, it is very, very difficult to get to know people, to have any sense of relationship with anybody. And I said to him, you know, there was a a time in America in which the description you just gave me was the description of how it was that if we functioned here, especially in smaller towns, and maybe in inner cities. But I said, this is a suburb, it's very different. And so a whole lot of what we do, we do by car. So you gotta find friends in different ways. And one of the ways you could do it is to come to church. Because the truth is you could get in a small group, even if you're not a Christian, you can get to know some really good people. It's groups that you gotta build your relationships through. Three weeks ago, I mentioned to you that for a person to go from being a a casual acquaintance to becoming a deeper friend, according to a study done by the University of Kansas, it takes 80 to 100 hours to really build, build what a friendship really is. Most of the time, who, the people that we call friends are just acquaintances. Maybe we see them out in the foyer as we walk into the church and we say hi to them, they say hi to us. We've seen them for years, we really like them, they're good people, they like us, but there is not a deep friendship because we haven't spent time together with each other. These are acquaintances, we like them, they're our friends. Sometimes that is how we view Facebook friends, we view other friends, they're acquaintances. But for a person to move into a deeper relationship, it takes between 80 to 100 hours and they've gotta be good hours. Gotta be you spending time with them. Why in the world would you ever wanna do that? Why would you ever wanna give up that kind of real estate in your life? for somebody else, because the reward is amazing. Listen to the definition. I've read of some some of the definitions that are out there of a friend. A friend is someone who goes on liking you no matter how successful either one of you are. A friend is someone who knows all about you and still likes you. Come on, that's a great friend, right? A friend is someone who believes in you, even in those times that you have stopped believing in yourself. The reward of having friends is absolutely amazing because when other people walk out, your friend walks in. There are many of you that have great, deep, abiding friendships. And this morning, I'm gonna talk about that very issue. And it may be there's some things in which God wants to sort of fine tune the friendships in your life. But there are others that are listening to me today. And the truth is, you are so hungry for a friend, for a real friend. But the truth is, you don't know how to get that started. You don't know how to make that kind of friend. And this morning, I wanna talk to you about that very thing. It is amazing, the Bible talks so much about friendship. The Bible is such an amazing book. It is so practical in every aspect of our life and even in the area of how to deepen the relationships of our life, what a friend really is. Jesus was asked the question, what's the most important thing in life? And he said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Notice his answer, it was all about relationships. The most important part of our life is about relationships. And the Bible is so great, so wise in helping us deepen the relationships of our life. And that's what I wanna talk to you about today. But before I do, let's go to God in prayer. I think across the country and the, the countries that are listening in today, and so many people, All of us need some help in building relationships in our life. Let's ask God to enter into this moment. Father, we come to you today, and the truth is, the whole issue of relationships of our life, we need to fine tune, we need to hone down. There are other people 
that you are wanting us to build deeper relationships with. And we ask, Father, you'd help us to better understand what that means and how we do it. What is the cost, but what is also the reward? And so, God, we ask that you would help us. And there are so many people that are listening to me that are really suffering from loneliness, especially because of this pandemic. And there is a great need to be able to share life with other people in our lives. And I pray, Father, you would help us and that you would answer that issue, that prayer that we are uttering up. Oh, God, bring friends. Help us to be friends. So move in our heart. Teach us from your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. The first thing that I want to talk about as we deal with the subject is simply this. That a lasting relationship requires a high cost. But it also has a great reward. it's, It's the whole idea that you get what you pay for. There is a great cost in being, having a deep relationship with other people. But oh, the reward is amazing. So let's talk about that for just a moment. There was a pretty famous study that was done, it was a Harvard study about adult development. And what they discovered in that study is one particular thing, there were a lot of things they they found out, but one of the particular things they discovered is that there is one element that can predict whether in your old age, how many of you wanting to live into old age? Yeah, it's all of us, right? And that can predict in your old age whether you'll be happy or you'll, you will be miserable. There is one ingredient that can predict it. And it's not how much money you have in the bank. And it's not how successful that you were in your career. And it is not your cholesterol level either. It's relationships. How well did you build the relationships of people that are in your family and your extended family? And how well did you build friendships that are not part of your family at all in your life? It will determine when those times come in your life that you are going to be maybe the loneliness perhaps, that you are happy and not lonely. It is the relationships of your life. My father lived to 92 years old and he uh, taught me a whole lot of things about life. But one of the things he taught me was about this very thing. My dad was an outgoing guy and, and uh, when he retired, he retired at the age of 61. And he always felt like he retired too soon. He should have lived, he should have worked a little longer, but, but he retired and my mom and my dad moved to Hot Springs Village, Arkansas. It is a village outside of Hot Springs and it's sort of a retirement area, but not everybody that lives there are retired. My dad was an avid golfer. He absolutely loved golf. And he played golf four times a week, four days a week, every week, pretty much, of the rest of his life, which was 30 more years. He played golf that much. I think I would die if I had to play golf that much. I am just terrible at it. He was fantastic at it. When he turned 70, at that point, he began to shoot his age multiple times every single year. He played golf that much. And in the course of time, he built these deep-seated relationships with the guys he played golf with to the point when they got sick, when they went to the hospital, he was always there for them. When they needed something, he was always there for them, and they were always there for him. Then my dad also developed this coffee time in which he invited guys that were uh, golf buddies, but also other people, and they would come and they would go to a coffee shop on Saturday morning, and they would spend two or three hours. They would be talking about God. They'd be talking about politics. They would be talking about current events. They would be solving world peace every Saturday morning. It was just amazing what they could accomplish in just a very short time. He built the relationships with these guys. And then my mom and my dad were always in small group at their church every single Sunday where they built deep, built deep relationships and friendships in their life of people that know the Lord and love God. My father built so many deep relationships and so did my mom. 
And in those times in which they were going through great times, they would always be serving those people that were those friends of theirs, and the times they were going through hard times, those friends would be true to them all the way to the end of their lives. That's friendship. The truth is, the key predictor of whether you're 20 and happy, or 30 and happy, or 50 and happy, is the very same thing if you're old and happy. It's the relationships of our lives. To have a deeper relationship with anybody is a high cost. So what are the things that it's going to cost you? Well, the first thing is that a lasting friendship is characterized by selflessness. The whole world, it seems like, is so selfish. And in fact, when we come into the world, it's total selfishness. All we know is that the world revolves around me. Hopefully some people outgrow that, but some people I think don't. The greatest thing that could ever happen is for a person to become selfless and begin to see other people and the world doesn't revolve around them. It's selflessness that it will cost you to have deep relationships. For look at what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 17, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. There are plenty of people that come in and out of our life and they say to us, I, I will like you, I'll love you, I'll like you, I'll be a friend of you as long as you do what I want you to do, as long as you say what I want you to say, as long as you be what I want you to be, I will be your friend. But the very moment that you're not, I'll walk out of your life. Now that's not a friend, that's an acquaintance. A friend is someone who is there for you in the times that does not benefit them, but the time that you need them most. A friend is somebody that is there when you are sick, when you are sad, when you are broke, when you are broken and they are still there for you. That is a real friend. So I'm gonna ask you to turn it around. Are there people in your life that even if they're not benefiting you, even if they can't benefit you because of what they're going through, maybe they are sick, maybe they're sad, maybe they're broke, maybe they're broken but you are there for them. You are helping them. That's a great indicator of the kind of person you are because a lasting relationship willingly sacrifices for the sake of others. Listen to how Jesus put it. He said in John chapter 15, verse 13, greater love has no one than this, this is the greatest test of love, that one lay down his life for his friends. Chris Betancourt, at the age of 18, 19 years of age, found out that he had leukemia. And he was told by his doctor, you have one year to live. The only way that that would be reversed, the only chance that Chris had was to have bone marrow uh, um, uh, exchange that took place in his body. It was the only chance he had. The problem was is that when we went through all of uh, the samples that were there, there was not a fit for him. And he came to a conclusion, I don't have a chance, more than likely, I've got one year to live. He had two great friends that were very close to him. It was a guy named Clay and a guy named Dylan. And these two guys just were broken hearted because of the situation their friend was in. And so they came up with an idea that was crazy. They went to their parents and their family and they talked to them about it and explained why they wanted to do it. And everyone was thumbs up. They made a decision that for one year we'll drop out of college. 
For one year, I'll give up my part-time job. And for this one year, everything is about Chris, not us. We'll figure out how we can make this the greatest year that Chris could ever have in his life. Well, as time went by, as they were putting all of this together, they decided to document everything they were doing because that pretty, pretty much is how everybody does it on YouTube. And so they began to document on YouTube this whole process. You can go to YouTube. It is called One List, One Life. And as they were sort of going through all of their planning with Chris and, and Dylan and Clay, they came up with 127 things that Chris would experience in this, the greatest year of his life. Some of the things were just very small things. Some, some were kind of medium sized. There was one that was humongous. For instance, one of the small things is that they decided, or this is one of the 127, they decided that they would eat the world's hottest pepper. Oh man, that, I can't do that. I, I couldn't do that. The world's hottest pepper. How many of you like hot stuff? Hot, spicy, it, the hotter the better. Raise your hand. I can't see all, all of the uh, campuses. We've got about 40 or 50 crazy people here at Sugarland Campus. I'm just kidding you, but come on. The world's hottest pepper. But they did it. One of them was to have a pillow fight with complete strangers. Now remember they're teenagers, okay? A pillow fight with complete strangers. But here was the big one. This was the toughest one. They decided that they would come up with a way to break a world record. And as they talked about what could that world record be, they came up with this idea. They decided they would break the world record for getting the most bone marrow donors signed up in one year. That was their goal. Now, they had begun a network and there were people that were now listening to the whole uh, uh, YouTube video and they were tuning in and they were responding back. They found every conceivable way to reach out to as many schools, as many businesses as they could uh, to be a donor for uh, bone marrow and they had the special day. And you know what? They broke the world record. They had 3,000 thousand seven hundred and fifteen people that donated for people that had leukemia on that day but it didn't end that day they kept the, the donations coming and they exceeded ten thousand people that became donors ten thousand people and one person out of the ten thousand was a perfect match for chris and saved his life. Isn't that amazing? Now look what happened. We're just talking about grassroots people. We're just talking about everyday people. But two guys said, my friend's got one more year. We're gonna make it the greatest year he's ever known. And in the process, they saved his life. Jesus said, greater love has no person than this, that he is willing to lay down his life for his friends. The greatest example of doing that was Jesus. Jesus already knew he was about to do it. Jesus came to the earth for really one great purpose. He did a lot of things. He told us things about God we didn't know. He, he showed miracles to us about the power of God, but there was one great thing Jesus came for. He came to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. We're the ones that sinned, not him. He's the one that suffered, not us. It was what the whole Lord's Supper was about that we just took, where we commemorated the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for us, the, the broken body of Jesus. That's what the bread represents. The spilt blood of Jesus, that's what the juice represents. Of how he gave himself for us. Jesus is simply teaching us the principle, the same one that we see in the illustration of, of Clay and Dylan. That part of the aspect of being a friend 
is putting somebody ahead of you, is being willing to sacrifice for somebody else, no matter if you're getting no benefit whatsoever. The first part of a deeper relationship with others is selflessness. The second part of a lasting friendship is being willing to be sharpened by others and being able to sharpen others. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17. Iron sharpens iron. So, so one man or woman sharpens another. The kind of person that you want to be around is the kind of person that sharpens you, that grows you, that takes you to another level. You want to be around someone that will lift you up. There is something about this person that makes you a better person. But now flip it. The same thing is true about you. Do you raise another person's life? Do you make another person a better person because that person is around you? It's the whole idea of a deeper relationship. We become like those that we spend our time with. This is why you gotta be very careful about who is that person or persons in your life that you're building a deeper relationship with because you've gotta find somebody who will actually lift you up, not bring you down. And they need to find in you the very same thing. Listen to what the Bible says in Proverbs 22, verse 24 and 25. Keep away from angry, short-tempered people or you will learn to be like them and they will ensnare your soul. He is saying, when you're around somebody who is an angry person, they're just angry all the time. They're having a fit all the time. And you hang around with that person, it won't be long until you begin to be just like that person. But that idea is true about everything. If you hang around with someone who all they do is gossip, oh, let me tell you about this, let me tell you about that, let me tell you about the other, it won't be long until you're gossiping. You're being a gossip just like them. You'll be around somebody who's always worried about literally everything, and it won't be long until you find yourself worried about seemingly everything. It won't be long until you become just like the persons that you build the deepest relationships with. But the reverse is exactly the same. You find someone who is kind. You find somebody who is upright in the way they treat other people. You find someone who is honest. You find people that have good characteristics to their life, and and you hang around those people, it won't be long until they begin to build you up. You begin to be more and more like them. You begin to have deeper and deeper convictions in your life, just like them. And that's what the Bible is talking about. Iron sharpens iron. Find somebody who sharpens your life and brings you up. And you be that person that does the same. When my oldest son, Matthew, was in middle school, uh, Matthew was uh, just really capable of making friendships, making relationships, and, and attracting other guys to, to be his friends. And he was living for God and loving the Lord. And, and all through middle school and high school, and what was happening is that he had a group of guys and they were at our house and he was at their house and it was just a great friendships, great friendships that were building in his life and, and he was a catalyst in that. And there were two, three times, two times in middle school, I believe one in high school, in which the parents came to us and we did not imagine anybody ever do this, but came to us and said, would it be okay if our son became a friend of Matthew. And we said, well, sure, what, 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 what do you, what's the deal? And each one of them said exactly the same thing. They said, we watch how Matthew lives. And we, we watch the friends that are around him. And our son is getting involved with wrong people. And if he could find a group of friends that could help him, it would be a change, a big change in his life. And we just think Matthew's the guy. And so I said, well, I'll, I'll talk to him. And every time Matthew said, of course. And Matthew reached out to that guy. And now all of a sudden, they became, that boy became part of our pictures as we began to have events. And, and he became one of those guys that other guys wanted to be like. 
here's the bottom line. We'll sooner or later become like the people that we build our deepest relationships with. Make sure it's someone who'll sharpen you and someone that you can sharpen. Find someone who has the characteristics that you want in your life and build a friendship with that person. There's a third thing, and that is a lasting friendship is loyal. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24 says, some friendships don't last, but some friendships are more loyal than brothers. Proverbs 19, verse 22, loyalty makes a person attractive. You wanna be around this person because you see how loyal this person is. This is a person who'll stick up for you. When other people walk away, this, pe- this person will walk in. They will be there for you. They will stand up for you. Doesn't mean that every time you're doing the right thing, sometimes you're going the wrong direction or you're doing the wrong thing. And privately, they will come because they love you and say, I just want to bring this to your attention, but publicly loyal to you. They're loyal to you because they're a friend because they understand what a relationship really is about. Part of loyalty includes forgiving. Proverbs 17 verse nine says, love forgives mistakes. Nagging about them parts the best of friends. Loving friends are good forgetters. They're not blind. They just choose to overlook sins. They come to us privately and talk about them. They're forgiving. They don't rub it in, they rub it out. They choose to overlook your faults. Now put them together. These three ideas that the Bible teaches, be selfless, find somebody that sharpens you, you can sharpen them. Find someone who's loyal and be loyal to that person. So here is the last thing. How do you do this now? How do you begin developing lasting relationships? Well, there's seven very quick bullets that I want you to see. The first one is simply this. Decide to be the right kind of friend, the right kind of person. Take the principles we've just talked about and begin to build them in your life so that that person that you build a relationship with can have a friend worth having. Third, decide to find the right kind of person. Remember, you're gonna become more like that person that you're hanging around with. Make sure they're the right person to be with. Proverbs 27 verse 19 says, a mirror reflects a man's face, but what he is really like is shown by the friends he chooses. Don Johnson found his life in a mess. Now pause for just a moment. As it turns out, we have several men in our church named Don Johnson. Not one of them are the person that I am now talking about, okay? So there you go. This Don Johnson has nothing to do with us. This Don Johnson I'm talking about is this guy. He, his life had become a wreck. He got involved with a group of guys and before long he was hooked on drugs, he was hooked on alcohol and his life was a mess. Finally, 10 years later, He found Alcoholics Anonymous and that organization, that ministry really actually helped him, brought him out. And the best I know, he's been sober for now, what, 20 years or more. But he was asked the question, and this is the reason for the illustration. He was asked the question, do you have any regrets? And here was the regret. He said, you bet I got a regret. I regret in high school, being friends with a group of people that ended up destroying my life. And today I wouldn't spend 10 minutes with them. They took more than 10 years out of my life. And here is what I wanna say to you. You be very careful about the friendships that you build. I'm talking about all of you who are children, all of you who are teenagers, all of you who are high schoolers. I'm telling you, be very careful in in college. Make sure you are careful about the people you hang around with because sooner or later, they'll either drag you up or they will drag you down. Decide to find the right kind of person. Don't just pick somebody who picks you. There needs to be a natural fit. It needs to be somebody you enjoy being around. Find the person who will spur you up 
and go after that person. Here's a third thing, take the initiative. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, 24, a person who has friends must show himself friendly. Jesus said, give and it'll be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Shall others pour into your lap with what measure you measure out, it'll be measured to you again. What Jesus is simply saying is, you take the initiative. You be the first to give. You be the first to reach out. You take the initiative of building relationships with other people. Don't sit at home saying, oh, I just don't have any friendships. Life is so miserable and, and, and horrible. No, don't do that. It will never change that way. You've got to take the initiative to build the relationships. One person said it this way. I went out to find a friend and there were no friends anywhere. I went out to be a friend and friends were all around. It's the motivation. It is reaching out, being a friend to other people. And it is amazing what will happen. It was Dale Carnegie. And we don't hear that name very often today, but a brilliant man. And he made this statement. You can make more friends in two months by becoming really interested in other people than you can in two years by trying to get other people interested in you. You see, it isn't about you. And when there comes a day that it's not about you, it's about others. Everything begins to change. You take the initiative to become friends with other people. Fourth, just be yourself. Don't try to be anybody else. Fifth, be patient. Relationships, good relationships, deep relationships take a long time. It means 80 to 100 hours, and it's got to be the right kind of hours. Be patient. Let it emerge. Give it time. Six, be reasonable. Don't be possessive for crying out loud. Don't smother other people. Always pushing yourself. The more you smother somebody else, the further away they go. So relax. And seventh is this, trust God to help you. It'll be a natural thing that emerges. The Bible says in Philippians chapter four, verse 19, and my God shall supply all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. So begin to pray for this. We all have this need. So begin to ask God, God, I need a friend. And so I'm going to take the initiative. I'm going to be friendly with people in my life. I'm going to help try to meet needs. I'm going to be there. I'm going to care for others. And it's not going to be a self-serving motivation. I am going to be out there and caring for other people. And here's what's going to happen. One day you're going to look up and suddenly you're going to find people that has become attracted to you. And God is beginning to pull them into your life. Give him the chance to do that. Have you ever given your heart to Christ? Have you ever asked the God of the universe to become a friend of yours? To come and know God through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty of your sin. He rose again from the grave and he offers to you the gift of eternal life. And I'm asking you today, maybe you're watching online, maybe you are in person, but I'm asking you today, would you open up your heart to come to know God? to come to know the one who sacrificed his life for you, Jesus Christ. In just a few moments after I pray, you'll get an invitation to what's called the Next Step Center. You can talk to one of our ministers online, a virtual Next Step Center. You can go to a physical Next Step Center if you're in person. But would you open up your heart to the next step that God has for you? Maybe it's coming to know Jesus as Savior. Maybe it's joining this church. Maybe it is, hey, how do I get involved with a small group? Or I want to serve somewhere. What is your next step? Whatever your next step is, would you open your heart to the next step center? You're opening your heart to God. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today. Lord, your word is amazing. It is so insightful, it is so wise, it is so practical in the areas in which we have our greatest needs and there is no greater need than relationship. You've taught us today how we are to be treating people in our lives 
that we have deep relationships with. God, there's some area we need to hone down and I pray you would help us take these truths and do it. But then, Father, these needs that we have of building more relationships may be the first one. Would you begin to show us the steps that we've talked about and how we can begin being this kind of person that you use? We ask, Father, that you give us friends, deep, abiding friends that build us up, that we build them up. Give us friends that honor you. Move in hearts today of those who do not know Christ yet, but maybe this is the day they come to know the God that made them. I pray you would move in their hearts to do it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.